friends, today I want to talk to you about the principles that animate my public service and uh, how I've fought for those principles in the past and how I hope to do so in the future. But let me begin by saying that there are a lot of people here who are very special to me, and I wish I could uh, call out each one of them, but I'm just going to do for that for two people. First of all, my mom. A great Fraser Valley girl who uh, married an Air Force pilot and the two of them ran some prominent schools and colleges across Canada. I'll tell you, she's the most formidable organizer I've ever known. <laughs> Mom, we should get you to run the campaign. Um, and the other person I wanted to acknowledge is the young fellow who led us in O Canada. And his name is Andrew Senya. Uh, Andrew immigrated to Canada just a few years ago. Uh, I was lucky enough to have him as an intern in my parliamentary office last summer. He did a pretty good job. Um, and uh, I just wanted to let you know that this young man who led us in O'Canada became a Canadian citizen just a month ago. Woo! We're proud of you, Andrew. Andrew reminds us of why we are all here. As we rededicate ourselves to the true North strong and free, we see in the face of a young, new Canadian like Andrew, the promise of the future and the greatness of a country that draws people from every corner of the earth to a land where dreams come true. That's what drew me uh, into public life and to devote my life to public service, uh, a passion constantly to renew Canada's promise as a land of opportunity so that every one of us, especially those who are least fortunate, can realize their God-given potential. But friends, the greatness of Canada is not an accident of history. Every day, people join our Canadian family having left behind uh, co countries seized by corruption, poverty, and tyranny. Why then are we different? Why are we considered a model to the world in so many ways? It's not, just be it's, it's not because, as Justin Trudeau says, we are a, quote, post-national state, or that be because we do not have, quotes a core identity. No, it's not because we are a reflection of the world. It is because we, Canadians, are the inheritors of a great tradition of ordered liberty based on the dignity of the human person incarnated in certain institutions and customs, customs like the rule of law, like limited parliamentary government, and the sanctity of property and contract. From these have come the brilliant achievements of free markets, free enterprise, and democratic capitaliz capitalism, of innovation and prosperity, all of which have harnessed human freedom to lift countless women and men out of poverty and despair to realize the greatness of their potential. Now, those aren't normal talking points, but I say these things because I want to start at the beginning. Far too often in politics, we forget what we're really about. We lose track of the first principles that move us, that motivate us. So I say to you, these are my first principles. I am a conservative because I believe we have an obligation to transmit uh, to, and renew these traditions of ordered liberty that have helped to make Canada the envy of the world. Friends, friends, this is what I've worked to do since first arriving here in Alberta some 25 years ago as a wet-behind-the-years youngster to help start the Canadian Taxpayers Federation. <laughs> at the time, government was growing and freedom was shrinking. Governments at all levels were raising taxes, running huge and growing deficits, racking up massive debts on future generations. Our provincial government was losing billions in failed schemes to intervene in the economy. And there seemed to be no end of this in sight. In the words of the Wall Street Journal, Canada was, quotes, a fiscal basket case. Do you remember that? The conventional wisdom at that time amongst the political and opinion elites was that Canadians would never tolerate fiscal restraint. But they were wrong. The Taxpayers' Federation began to give voice to the silent majority who were fed up with governments who were taking nearly half of their families' incomes. At the federal level, the Reform Party did the unthinkable and openly campaigned on spending restraint to balance the budget 
and then reduce the tax burden. And then, lo and behold, lo and behold, the most remarkable lead leader emerged right here in Alberta, that man with a twinkle in his eye, the late, great Ralph Klein. <laughs> Ralph, well, he did the impossible. In the space of just two years, he eliminated the biggest provincial deficit in Canada, then he eliminated the debt, he brought in the flat tax, and he gave Albertans more choice and convenience in their public services. And he did much of this while oil was as low as $10 a barrel. We miss you, Ralph. My goodness, we miss you. So as a young 20-something, head of the Taxpayers' Federation, those were pretty heady days for me. Uh, and I see some of the, his colleagues from the legislature and cabinet in this room, and heady days for all of us then. Ralph and I famously squared off uh, in front of the TV cameras a couple of times. Um, but, uh, and uh, Joan Crockett here was covering those for the Calgary Herald at the time. She remembers. Uh, but you know, one thing about Ralph is that when he was wrong, and that wasn't too often, but when he was wrong, he admitted it. And on issue after issue, he listened. He took our advice from the Taxpayers' Federation, and he turned it into government policy. Now, let me just tell you a, a story. I'll never forget this. One morning, uh, I held a news conference in, near the legislature, and I, uh, later that day, oh, excuse me, the, the news conference was calling for the government to bring in a elegantly named No More Boondoggles legislation, <laughs> um, calling for banning government subsidies to private enterprise. No more picking winners and losers. So later that day, my phone rang. It was the premier, called me directly. I said, Jason, come on over here to my condo. So later on that night, I met up with him, and over a beer or two, we, I briefed him on the No More Boondoggles legislation. He listened, he asked some questions, and then he said, you know, this makes a lot of sense. The No More Boondoggles legislation became the law of Alberta six weeks later. That was Ralph Klein. You know, the same thing happened with taxpayer protection legislation, balanced budget legislation, pension reform, the flat tax. I learned then that if you had a good principled idea backed by the people, it could be unstoppable, especially if you had a premier with a surplus of common sense who truly governed for the people. So as president of the Taxpayers Federation, uh, I went on to fight the same fight at the national level, pressing the Chrétien government to stop Canada from going over the fiscal cliff in the mid-1990s. When the Liberals released trial balloons about major tax increases at that time, we sprang into action with a series of no more taxes rallies across the country. And what, it, and what now seems like a political miracle, the Liberals listened to Canadians. They did. They cut spending. They balanced the budget and eventually they reduced our taxes. Now they deserve credit for that. But so too did Ralph Klein and Albertans by demonstrating that Canadians would reward rather than punish politicians who put our finances in order. We changed the politics of this country for the better by showing that we were mature Albertans that wanted fiscal discipline, and we want it back now. So friends, emboldened by these experiences, I decided to take the fight for more freedom to the floor of the House of Commons. I did so in part because I wanted to promote unity amongst Conservatives at the federal level so that vote splitting between the Reform and PC parties didn't lead to permanent Liberal governments. And so Preston Manning asked me to head up the United Alternative Project where I crisscrossed the country trying to find common ground for unity between grassroots Tories and Reformers. I learned that no amount of goodwill, however, at the local level could overcome obstinate leadership. It's true. Thousands, thousands of grassroots Tories, they wanted to stop the division, but Joe Clark and a small group of insiders shut them down at every pass. But eventually, eventually two courageous, courageous leaders stepped forward, Peter McKay and Stephen Harper. They had the vision to look forward with confidence rather than backward with bitterness. They focused on what united us 
instead of what divided us. They realized that the future of Canadian conservatism and in some ways the vitality of our democracy demanded unity through strong leadership. Leadership which led to the creation of the Conservative Party of Canada 13 years ago and to the longest serving Conservative government in the 20th century. A government a government that cut the federal tax burden to its lowest level in six decades, that gave Canada the strongest economy in the G7 during the global crisis, that restored balance to the justice system, that gave Canada a strong and principled voice in world affairs, a government that gave prairie farmers marketing freedom, scrapped the long arm registry, and did so much else to expand freedom. I was honored to play a role in that Conservative government as Canada's longest serving Minister of Citizenship and Immigration, implementing fundamental reforms to help new Canadians succeed while strengthening the fairness and integrity of the system. And as Minister of Employment, where I launched the skills agenda to boost trade training and implemented the Canada Jobs Grant. And as Minister of National Defence, a great honour, working with our men and women in uniform and deploying the Canadian Armed Forces to take the fight to the ISIL terrorists in the Middle East and to help strengthen the Ukrainian military in facing their Russian adversary. But perhaps the most enriching experience for me during the past decade has been working with a remarkable team to reach out to new Canadians and members of our cultural communities, turning hundreds of thousands of natural, intuitive, small C conservatives into big C conservatives. Now, it's true that I literally attended thousands of events, earning me the nickname, the Minister for Curry in a Hurry. <laughs> uh, I think some people in the Chinese community nicknamed me uh, the Smiling Buddha, which I take as a compliment. I didn't just get nicknames, I also acquired a couple of extra notches in my belt at these, uh, on the Curry circuit. <laughs> but. But it's also true that in doing so, I was consistently inspired, I was truly inspired, by the stories of so many Canadians who had overcome remarkable adversity to make Canada their new home and to succeed and to contribute to our society. And I am proud to say that over three elections, we doubled the Conservative vote amongst new Canadians and became the only centre-right party in the world that wins a higher percentage of votes amongst immigrants than native-born citizens. And don't, and don't believe the critics. That was true in the 2015 campaign as well. Uh, so, friends, all of that brings me to today. I look back with deep gratitude on my 19 years in Parliament, including my decade in the Federal Cabinet. The Federal Conservative Party is now beginning a process of renewal, uh, made easier by the fantastic interim leadership of my friend, the Honourable Ronna Ambrose. <laughs> and I have been encouraged by thousands of Conservatives to play a role to help lead that renewal by pursuing the federal party leadership. I thank all of those people for their confidence in me. However, after a great deal of reflection, I've come to the conclusion that I can more effectively serve this country that I love and advance the conservative cause in a different way. Alors, uh, j'ai été encouragé par milliers de militants conservateurs à me présenter au chefferie du Parti conservateur national. Je les remercie de leur confiance envers moi, mais j'ai pris la décision que je peux faire davantage pour la cause et pour mon pays que j'aime d'une façon différente. Since the federal election in October, I've been blessed to uh, be able to spend a whole lot more time back here at home. And what I've heard from fellow Albertans in that time has moved me and disturbed me. I've seen a proud man, an engineer in his 50s, break down in tears in front of me, tears of shame and frustration, because after a lifetime of hard work, he was an immigrant to Canada from Poland, after a lifetime of hard work, after having developed patented technologies for our 
energy industry. He had been un he's unemployed for over a year with no light at the end of the tunnel. Everybody in this room knows somebody like that in Alberta today. I've met small business owners who, after 25 years of ups and downs, uh, of good times and bad, after investing their life savings, after working 90 and 100 hour weeks, are finally throwing in the, the towel because they tell me that every level of government seems to be stacking the decks against them. I've met young Albertans who did what they were told to do. They, they borrowed money, they went into debt to get through university, and now they cannot find a job in this province at their skill level uh, because we are now living through the highest level of unemployment in this province in decades. I have met new Canadians who immigrated to Alberta. I mean, one family in particular who uh, I met in Ireland. I encouraged them to immigrate here to Calgary. They got a good start, and then the downturn happened. And they burned through their savings, and they went back home to Ireland. And others who have gone to other provinces, they heard that Alberta was the land of opportunity. But under the NDP, it no longer is. Albertans I meet cannot believe that we have a government that is systematically destroying the Alberta advantage that made this province a magnet for risk takers and wealth creators. And they are disturbed the, to find that we have both federal and provincial governments that, seemed, that seem today to be ashamed of our huge engine of wealth and opportunity, our oil and gas industry. So friends, you know, Albertans are sophisticated people. They understand that global commodity prices fluctuate and they're beyond our control. But what they don't understand are governments that seem intent on making a bad situation much worse, piling on new costs, new regulations and new taxes, dragging down those who are struggling to keep their heads above water. So following a crash in the price of our most important commodities, hurting businesses and families from Milk River to Manning, the NDP government has decided to raise taxes on employers, to support Justin Trudeau's huge new payroll tax, to kill entry-level jobs by raising the minimum wage during a recession because of their ideology, uh, by raising taxes on wealth-creating individuals and chasing out investment, by shutting down the coal industry, again, for ideological reasons, that massively increasing property taxes, especially on businesses, putting many of them under, and imposing an, economic, an enormous multi-billion dollar carbon tax on everything that was never even mentioned in their platform. <laughs> For which they have no democratic mandate. And now, imposing costly new regulations with no regard whatsoever for their economic impact. A government that, at that has attacked Alberta's hardworking farmers with Bill, C Bill 6, and that, is ra that will rack up, by the end of this term, at least $47 billion in new debt on future generations. And let me just pause there to say, we talk I talked about what Ralph did. It was not easy. It required sacrifice. It required enormous sacrifice from every sector of Alberta society to balance the budget, to pay down our debt, and to create the Alberta advantage. And these guys in Edmonton, for ideological reasons, are just throwing all of that sacrifice away and imposing $50 billion of new debt on future generations. You know, to quote Ronald Reagan, their attitude seems to be that if it moves, tax it, if it keeps moving, regulate it, and if it stops moving, subsidize it. And they've only just begun. Now they're planning, quotes, radical changes to the school curriculum. Y you know what that means for these ideologues? It, it doesn't mean better measurable school outcomes. It means social engineering and pedagogical fads in our schools. <laughs> friends, friends, enough is enough. We must fight the ideological agenda of this accidental NDP government to limit, limit the damage that they do to our province now, and we must do everything within our power to eliminate the risk of a second ND, NDP term, which would be catastrophic to the long-term future of Alberta. <laughs> Woo! 
And so after months of consultation, I have come to the conclusion that there is only one way to eliminate that risk, only one way to ensure that we defeat the NDP in 2019 and get Alberta back on the right track. And that is to unite Albertans around a common cause. Around, around a united, principled, compassionate and diverse free enterprise party. A party characterized by a sense of hope, optimism and opportunity. A party focused on the concerns and struggles of ordinary Albertans. And friends, that means that the Progressive, Conservative and Wild Rose parties must put Alberta first. We must focus... They must put, they, we must put Alberta first, and we must focus on the future, not the past, on what unites us, not what divides us. We must come together to form a single free enterprise party, and we must do so before the next election. Because to coin a phrase, Albertans can't wait. Friends, that is why I've decided to seek the leadership of the Progressive Conservative Party of Alberta. Thank you. That is why I've decided to seek the leadership of the Progressive Conservative Party of Alberta, seeking an explicit mandate to unite with the Wild Rose Party and all like-minded Albertans so we can defeat the NDP and put this province back on the right track. <laughs> <laughs>